to worship here at Braddock Street Church, where we strive to be followers of Jesus, loving God in worship, loving others in small groups, and serving the world in mission. My name is Annalise, and I'm one of the pastors here at Braddock Street, and I'm so glad that all of you are joining us this morning. We want to say good morning to everybody who's with us online as well. We're so glad that you all are here. Thanks for being here. If you are new to us and you're online, you will see in the Facebook comment sections a, uh, a digital sign-in card. If you take a moment to fill that out, it'll help us get to know you a little bit better. You can also leave prayer requests there or just say good morning, let us know you're with us. You can like and comment, share, all of those things. We are so glad that you all are here. And if you are here with us in the room, you will find uh, a green card in the pew back in front of you. And if you are new, you can fill that out and leave it for us in the offering plate so that we can get to know you a little bit better. And so we would like to um, invite the Dove family to come forward and they're going to lead us through the lighting of the Advent wreath. And as a reminder, there is a sung response to what they will read to us today, okay?
try that again. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. For a child has been born to us, a son given to us. Authority rests upon his shoulders, and he is named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. We light this candle as a symbol of Christ, the Prince of Peace. May the light of Christ break through the darkness and show us the way of reconciliation and repentance. Please join us as we sing, Even So Come.
please see as we invite Emily to read our morning scripture. Today's scripture comes from Matthew chapter 3, verses 1 through 12. In those days, John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness of Judea, proclaiming, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. This is the one of whom the prophet Isaiah spoke when he said, The voice of one crying out in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Now John wore clothing of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. Then the people of Jerusalem and all of Judea were going out to him, and all the region along the Jordan, and they were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. But when he saw many Pharisees and Sadducees coming for baptism, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruit worthy of repentance. Do not presume to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our ancestor. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up the children of Abraham. Even now the axe is lying at the root of the tree. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize you with water for repentance, but one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to carry his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor and will gather his wheat into the granary, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. The word of God for the people of God. my friends how are you all good for those of you that were here last week we started talking about this book and I'm gonna review a little bit of what we learned last week okay so we're starting off with this funny guy the Grinch right and he hangs out up here on Mount Crumpet all alone by himself and how does he feel about Christmas not a fan right does not like Christmas as a matter of fact this book says he hates it. He hates Christmas. So, what does he decide to do? Anybody remember? He's going to steal it. You're right. He's going to steal Christmas. So you see here all of the who's getting ready to celebrate. Here they are, but the Grinch comes up with an idea. And the book says that he got an idea, and it was an awful idea. The Grinch got a wonderful, awful idea. And that idea is what? He's going to steal Christmas. Now, how is he going to do that? What's he going to do? Right here. He's going to take everybody's gifts away. What else is he going to take away? Trees. Trees, what else? One more time. Ornaments, all the ornaments. Yep, what else? All the food, the decorations. The stockings, the tree, he's going to take it all. Now, some of us already know the end of this story. And if you don't, I'm sorry, I'm going to spoil it for you. Does it work? No, it doesn't work, does it? It does not work because at the heart of the story is Christmas. And Christmas is going to show up even if all of the decorations and all the food and all the trees and all the ornaments and all the gifts, even if it all goes away, we're still going to have Christmas because what is Christmas about? Family. Family. That's a good answer. Yes. Jesus's birthday. Jesus is going to be born and his birthday is going to happen even if there are no trees and no gifts and no presents. And today we are talking about Jesus as the Prince of Peace. Now, You might think that the Grinch was looking for a little bit of peace, right? He didn't like all of that loud noise that the Who's were making down there, all that chaos and commotion, which is why he comes up with his wonderful, awful idea, right? But what does peace mean? What does the word peace mean? Peace and quiet, okay, what else? Yes. Yeah, it means no war, no fighting, no conflict, right? Yes? It means peace. There you go. Very good. So for us, we find out that what the Grinch thinks of as peace is peace and quiet, right? He wants everything to be quiet and orderly so that he doesn't have to think about Christmas. 
But what does peace actually look like at the end of the book? How's the book end? Right there. It ends with them all eating together. It ends with them all being together. So peace in this story and for us doesn't necessarily just mean quiet or even just the absence of conflict, but it's everybody together in community and they're sharing together in the love of Christmas. Good? Very good. All right, we will continue talking about the story next week, but for now, I'm going to pray for us and then you all are welcome to go with Miss Jeanette back to Children's Church if you would like or back to your families, okay? But first, let's pray. Holy God, today we remember that you are the Prince of Peace and we know that no matter what, your birthday is coming and we will celebrate it all together in peace and in love. We love you. Amen. Thank you, friends. You can head on out. It is important to us here at Braddock Street that you all know what we are able to do because of the gifts that you give. And so we want to raise up for you the Salvation Army. Salvation Army is so important in our community. Not only do they provide things like um, low-cost home goods and things that you might need in your house, they also provide jobs for people in our community, and Salvation Army is one of the most important shelters that we have. We felt that a couple of weeks ago, they were closed to do some renovation. And let me tell you, that was one of the busiest Monday night dinners that we have seen in a long time because that shelter was closed for just a little while. So we want to continuously be in support of Salvation Army as they do really important work of making sure that people in our community have a safe place to be. And so we are thankful for you all and for the gifts that you give, and we will invite our ushers to come forward as we enjoy together our offering song. Go tell it on the mountain, the one Tell it on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere that we can be forgiven. The weight of all our sin He came to bear. Emmanuel, God with us. Emmanuel.
Oh, Amen. Thank you, band, for helping us to hear the good news in a whole new way with the art of music. Uh, my name is Kirk Nave. I'm one of the pastors here at Braddock Street Church. And today we continue our worship series entitled, The Heart That Grew Three Sizes. We're looking at the good news of the coming of Jesus Christ, kind of looking also through the lens of how the Grinch stole Christmas and the change of heart that he experienced that we might experience it as well. If you want to go deeper, we have some small groups looking at this. Our Oglesby, Cornania, and Jubilee classes, which are meeting now at 10 o'clock. Annalise is also leading a class that meets at 8.45 each Sunday morning through Advent, uh, looking at this study, and they'll be in room 137 next, next week. Let's pray together. Thank you, Lord, that you are coming. And now let us prepare our hearts that you might be born anew here within us and we might be changed. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior, amen. So this week, my wife and I were doing what a lot of people are doing, running errands, right, getting things together, doing some shopping, trying to get it all lined up before it gets too late. And there on my playlist through the car radio came uh, the classic Christmas carol, Blue Christmas, um, sung by the wonderful voice of Porky Pig. <laughs> and I just started laughing. It's one, my playlist for Christmas is all those songs from my childhood and beyond, you know, the ones that are, are beautiful and, and soft and wonderful and those that are just funny and make me laugh. That one always makes me laugh. And Stephanie said, why are you laughing? I, but it's funny. He cracks me up. I don't know why. But you listen to this every year, don't you? Yes. And you hear it over and over. Yes. And, and it makes me laugh every time. I don't know why. It's become one of those Christmas traditions for me. And I think we all have them. Matt Rawl in his book, The Heart That Grew Three Sizes, suggests that all of us have those Christmas traditions so that Christmas begins to feel like Christmas. The songs that we listen to the things that we do, for some of us, it's baking or making something for someone. For others, it's the certain videos that you have to watch. And when you get those, then it really begins to feel like Christmas. And one of the things that Matt Rawl says to us in the book is that there are a number of the most important aspects of Christmas that don't feel like Christmas at all because we really don't want to confront ourselves with those things. We're preparing our hearts for the coming of Jesus. And we know with our heads it, mean, it has nothing to do with all the errands we've got to run, the songs that we listen to, the videos we watch. It really has nothing to do with that, not even Porky Pig singing an Elvis Presley song. Listen to what John the Baptist says at the beginning of Jesus' ministry here in Matthew chapter 3. In those days, John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness of Judea proclaiming, repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. For those of you that don't know the story, uh, this is the beginning of the ministry of Jesus. Jesus is going to be baptized by John the Baptist. So this kind of sets the tone. John the Baptist is understood the way, particularly the way Matthew presents him as Elijah, the second coming of Elijah. That's supposed to happen for Israel before Messiah comes. And Matthew's saying, here's Elijah, John the Baptist, saying, prepare the way of the Lord Jesus is coming. Messiah is coming, okay? He's proclaiming the coming of the Messiah. And I want you to pay attention to the tense of what he said. John the Baptist said, the kingdom of heaven has come near. Many of us Christians are too guilty of proclaiming the gospel in this way, you know. Repent or else. Repent. Jesus the judge is coming. You get that? Some of us get that message from time to time. In fact, John the Baptist says, repent for the kingdom of heaven has come near. It's already here. Jesus makes the kingdom of heaven present in part, right? It's not full. The world isn't right yet. But he makes it present so that you and I can begin this connection with God in Jesus Christ. Edvard Schweitzer, in his commentary on the, on the Gospel of Matthew, puts it this way. It is only God's coming to people that makes it possible for people to come to God. 
In other words, God's, God moves first, always moves first. Every Christian tradition, we may have different nuances of this. We Methodists talk about prevenient grace or the grace of God that comes before our awareness or our understanding. Uh, Presbyterians might talk about predestining grace and so forth. Notice that there are differences in the two of them, but both of them affirm that God moves first in this relationship. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. Christ is already present in our lives by the power of the Holy Spirit, so now is the time to repent. And for those of you that have never really studied these words, repent means a lot more than saying, I'm sorry, right? I'm sorry to somebody that we have offended or in that sense that we have offended God. We need confession of our sins and naming the fact that we have harmed God or harmed someone else by our actions. But repent means to literally change direction. In other words, change the behavior. Not just say, I'm sorry, and I won't do it next time. No, start right now and change your behavior. It literally means turn around 180 degrees. Do an about face, turn away from selfishness and sinfulness, and turn directly towards God. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. So we make this known, we, we, we hear this message, okay, this is the message, and then in this message, the religious people show up, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and John the Baptist attacks our religious smugness. Look what it says here in Matthew 3, verse 7, but when he saw many Pharisees and Sadducees coming for baptism, he said to them, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? He's saying, you bunch of snakes. You religious people, you think you've got it down. John the Baptist is attacking the smugness of religious people. These people are religious authorities. They should know better. But they think they've got it down. It's almost like they come to see what John the Baptist is up to by the River Jordan rather than baptism for themselves. You think you're not a religious, smug person? Have you ever said the phrase Christmas and Easter? Maybe you haven't. Maybe it's just people in my circle that use that phrase. Um, but the idea is there are people who show up for church only at Christmas and Easter, you know? And we'll have this beautiful Christmas Eve celebration, and then there'll be a couple of people who are just like, oh, look who showed up in church. Must be either Christmas or Easter. We all have this idea. Those of us that are religious, we, we take our, our redemption for granted. We think we've got it down, and we don't need any more improvement. We Wesleyan Christians and just about every other Christian have a, have a name for it. It's called sanctification. God's Holy Spirit is always making us better people, moving us more and more to the image of Jesus Christ. We can never be smug, not for a moment. And John the Baptist tells them, you know, you bunch of snakes. He goes on in verse 9, bear fruit worthy of repentance. Do not presume to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our ancestor, for I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children to a Abraham. Bear fruit worthy of repentance. Change your life so that people can see God in you. Do not say for a moment, we have Abraham as our ancestor. That was part of Israel's uh, understanding, one of their assumptions. We're the nation of Israel. God will never abandon us. God may correct us as God has in the past, but God will never abandon us. So as long as I'm a child of Abraham, I'm going to heaven. People never say anything like that, do they? I was baptized as a child, or I was baptized and I professed my faith. I'm going to heaven. My work here is done. John the Baptist says, don't rely on, oh, I'm Methodist because my mother was Methodist or whatever, you know. Don't rely on being a child of Abraham. No, bear fruit that is worthy of repentance. Let people see it in what you do, the way you live your life. What do we know about fruit? Well, naturally, fruit comes out of a plant by, by its very nature, right? It's like the plant doesn't even have to try. An apple tree doesn't even have to try to bear apples, but by the same token, a corn stalk will not bear apples. The point of that is Christians bear fruit. What is our fruit? In one word, love. Right? 
Christians bear love. Think about the people who kind of are a model Christian for you. Think about their nature. When they give you something or do something for you or they say something nice about you and and cheer you up, you realize they don't have any hidden agenda. They just do that because that's who they are. It's like natural fruit that comes out of the Christian life. You begin this life with Jesus and over time, God's Holy Spirit shapes us and molds us more and more into the, according to the image of Christ. It helps to have a community that models it for us so that before you know it, all of a sudden you're doing nice things for other people and you do it. Why? Just because it comes naturally. And when you gather a bunch of people together, we have to list before you, before the offering, every single Sunday, the many ways that you are showing Christ's love in our community and beyond. beyond. Salvation Army. Congregational Community Action Program, also known as CCAP. First line of defense for the poor in this community. This church is one of the largest contributors. The Giving Tree, bringing gifts to needy kids and seniors who would otherwise be completely alone. You're doing that. I hope you were here last week to hear Betty Sue's beautiful story of one person receiving a doll and it bringing tears to her eyes. That's Christ through you. Over and over and over, Monday night, dinner, the adult daycare center, which this church helped to get started, helping children worldwide, helping children halfway around the world in Sierra Leone, raising some of them up to to become doctors, right? You're doing that. Why? Naturally. Because it's what Christ calls us to do, to bear fruit worthy of repentance. Now, that means At some point instantaneously or over a long period of time, it's a drastic change. John the Baptist uses some drastic imagery. The axe is lying at the root of the tree. He talks about the burning of chaff. He talks about being baptized with the Holy Spirit and with fire. It is drastic change from what we used to be. And friends, that's the essence of the good news of Christmas. We fill our celebrations to make sure we have the right feeling. Like it really feels like Christmas this year. And we probably long for that this year, you know, because the pandemic two years ago and last year we were starting to come back together, but it really wasn't the full thing, right? Matt Rawl talks about in his book, talks about his congregation, Christmas 2020 in the throes of the pandemic. They're in Shreveport, Louisiana, and they went outside, you know, had lights, guitars, a lot of the stuff was taken away. And he said it was so beautiful because for him and for many in the congregation, it was like complete simplicity, more like the birth of Jesus itself. Take away all the trappings and you can see what this really means. Of course, as I read the story, I went back to pandemic 2020, and oh boy, we wanted to go outside, but we're not in Shreveport. We're in Winchester, which means at this time of year, whenever the church tries to do anything outside, the forecast will be wintry mix. And that's what it was, 40-some degrees and and rain. I think there was a few snow flurries, and it was, we knew it was going to be a muddy mess out in that field. So, yeah, we came back in here, and we just put it online. It was frustrating. But he asked in his book one of the study questions that I thought I would ask myself What is the most important or most meaningful celebration of Christmas for you? And it came to me pretty quickly. 2021, Christmas Eve, I was standing there at the back door, raising my candle, singing Silent Night with everybody else. And it wasn't the music, it wasn't even the lyrics of Silent Night. What became most meaningful in that moment for me was you, the community of faith. Still in a pandemic, but lifting up the light of Christ in a darkened world to stand shoulder to shoulder with you to say, yes, there is hope. One day God will deliver. Pandemics will not be forever. The The world will not be war after war after war. People will not experience famine after famine after famine. One day when Christ ushers in his his kingdom and fullness, right, we will be delivered from all things. And for us personally today, that includes our sinfulness. One thing Matt Rawl lifted up for me in his book that was new was a 
lifting up a couple other of the biblical stories about the gospel that I, I hadn't seen in this light before. And one was the wise men who come from the east. He suggested that these are symbols of Babylon, Israel's historic enemy, right? Babylon took Israel into slavery and demolished the temple and, and the whole city of Jerusalem. This is Israel's arch enemy, and they are included in the redemption that God has. That's powerful. He also mentioned the other piece of Matthew's gospel, the story of the Holy Family. Remember, Herod was going to king, kill the firstborn of each family because that would kill this person who was going to be raised up king of the Jews instead of Herod. And the Holy Family, Mary, Joseph, and Jesus, headed for Egypt, living in another nation without any paperwork, right? You could consider them undocumented aliens if you'd like. But Egypt who embodied slavery for Israel. They too are included in God's story of redemption. And Matt Rawl had this beautiful quote that was really helpful for me. Here it is. He says in this second chapter, grace is the greatest gift when it's offered to us, but it is the toughest pill in the world to swallow when it's offered to someone we don't think deserves it. Jesus Christ comes to bring redemption and salvation And that includes our enemies, right? That includes the people we think don't deserve it. But make no mistake, it includes you and me. Or as 1 Timothy put it, 1 Timothy 1.15, the saying is sure and worthy of full acceptance that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. That's why he came. And we cannot be so smug to think, oh, we've already got salvation. No, there's a process of sanctification where God is making us into more and more holy and loving people throughout our lives. You know, there are traditions where on a Sunday morning or certainly any Wednesday night service or whatever, they'll have what is called an altar call where the pastor will, you know, Make people aware of their sinfulness and then invite them forward to kneel and to to ask forgiveness and probably a very tearful prayer will happen. Sometimes people will come to me and say, Kirk, why don't we do altar calls? And I'm like, we do them the first Sunday of every month in this thing we call communion. Because before we come to the table, do you know what we do? We confess our sin. I lead you through that in this service Um, In the traditional services, we say a corporate prayer of confession, and then we have a time of silent prayer of confession. And that's what we're going to do here in just a moment. I'm going to invite you to offer your prayers of confession before God. So whether you come from a church where you had altar calls on a regular basis, or you came for the first Sunday of every month and celebrated communion and said confession, either way, you know, that can become rote becomes just something that we do all the time and we don't think about it. This morning, I want you to think about it. I want you to think about why Jesus comes, because what we believe about this sacred mystery is Jesus Christ is present at this holy meal by the power of the Holy Spirit. So before we come into his presence, let us confess our sin that we might lead a life worthy of repentance. Let us pray. Almighty God, we come especially this morning preparing our hearts for your coming. And none of us are worthy to receive your love. We are certainly not worthy to receive forgiveness. But God, do it anyway. We know you to be a merciful God. We know that you give us your Son, Jesus Christ, for this very purpose. So now, God, in that spirit, In a period of silence, we lift up our prayers of confession to you. And now hear the good news. Christ died for us while you and I were still sinners. That proves God's love for us. In the name of Jesus Christ, You are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. So lift up your hearts and give thanks to God for all that God has given. 
our own creation, our own existence. Just as God created the world and put people in it and called a nation known as Israel to live with God, they didn't get it right, just like you and I don't get it right. God sent prophets and they wouldn't listen. And in the fullness of time, God sent Jesus Christ, our Savior, who on the night in which He gave His life for us took bread, gave thanks to you, God, and broke the bread and gave it to His disciples and said, take, eat, for this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And when the supper was over, He took the cup. And when He had given thanks to you, He gave it to His disciples and said, drink from this, all of you. For this is my blood poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this every time you drink it in remembrance of me. And so as we remember what you have done for us in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's sacrifice for us. And now, God, pour out your Holy Spirit upon us gathered here in this room and upon these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ so that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by His blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ returns in final victory and we feast at His heavenly table. In the name of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, who has also taught us to, say as, to pray as we say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. The Lord's table is ready for you to come, and everyone is welcome. You need not be a member of our congregation. Anyone who wants to lead a new life in Jesus Christ is always invited and welcomed to His table. We'll ask those that are going to assist us to come forward at this time to prepare. And there will be a station in front of each of the three sections of the sanctuary You'll come forward, if this group will come by your left and, and come by the outer aisle and return by the more central aisle. If these two central sections, if you'll go all the way across to the far side to come to the center and you'll be served over here, I think you're coming by the center aisle and returning by the outer aisle. You'll be given a piece of bread and you'll have an individual cup to receive. If you need gluten-free elements, they are here at this table to my left. I invite you to come forward as you are led.
Let us join our hearts in prayer. Thank you, God, for this holy mystery where we dare come to your sacred presence, forgiven and set free. Let us rise from this table, bearing the fruit of Christ's love with everyone we meet, with the blessing of God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. I invite you to stand as you are able as we sing our final song together.
go, a, a couple of things to know. Uh, if you're participating in our Giving Tree gift program, uh, making Christmas possible for kids who are poor as well as seniors in our community, those gifts need to be returned today. Uh, so please try and do that. Betty Sue's back there waiting for you. Also, the wrapping party for that will be a week from Friday on the 16th at 6 p.m. It's a lot of fun to just wrap all those gifts over in the fellowship hall. One other thing to know is today after our next worship service, uh, one of our United Methodist missionaries, Jennifer Moore, will be hosted for a uh, fellowship luncheon put together by our United Women in Faith. Reservations were required, but they also prepared a few extra. So if you really want to go and hear what she has to say about her work, please feel free to come. But now, recognize that our God is greater, greater than the evil outside of us as well as the evil within us. You are forgiven. Now rise and bear fruit, the fruit of Christian love, and go with the blessing of God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Our God is greater. You are higher than any other. Our God is greater, awesome in power. Our God, our God. And if our God is for us, then we can never stop us. And if our God is with us, then what can stand in this? And if our God is for us, then we can never stop us. And if our God Street.